Welcome to Continuing Mobile Education for Emergency Medical Services Providers. This is Pediatric Seizures, Episode 1, Anatomy and Pathophysiology. After watching this episode, participants should understand basic terminology associated with seizures and seizure patients, understand the pathophysiology behind seizure activity in infants, toddlers, and school-aged children, and understand differential diagnosis between seizures and other pathologies with similar presentations. So seizure is uh, the physical manifestation of an electrical change in the brain where you have repetitive uh, territory of the brain having repetitive electrical stimulation uh, that is abnormal. We see that on the body in the setting of shaking, staring off, a variety of different ways depending on what part of the brain is affected. Epilepsy is what happens when you've had a seizure before and you have the possibility of having seizures again. So not everyone who has had a seizure necessarily has epilepsy. So status epilepticus is the state of being in a seizure, either an electrical seizure or a physical seizure that we can see. Um, the official definitions epidemiologically are that seizure has been going on for more than 30 minutes. Traditionally though, in the medical population, we consider any seizure over about five minutes to be impending status. Essentially, the much more likelihood that you're going to continue once you've started to seize for over five minutes. Most seizures actually stop on their own, and so, starting to have a seizure that is prolonged is an important medical factor that we need to take care of. So there's an entity also called acute repetitive seizure that is starting to be used, though traditionally we just describe it as clusters of seizures. So uh, patients who have had more than three seizures in an hour or just multiple short seizures without significantly regaining consciousness in between them and that state has lasted for longer than five minutes are also considered to have been in status epilepticus. To review, a seizure is defined as a convulsion or sudden alteration of consciousness, which is usually accompanied by motor activity and or sensory phenomena caused by an abnormal discharge of electrical energy in the brain. Epilepsy is a common chronic neurologic disorder characterized by recurrent unprovoked seizures. Just because a person has a seizure, it does not mean they have epilepsy. Impending status epilepticus is the state of having continuous seizures for longer than five minutes. This is a strong indicator that the patient will continue to seize unless medically treated to stop the seizure. Acute repetitive seizures or cluster seizures are multiple seizures without regaining consciousness and can be treated as impending status epilepticus. While many causes of seizures are seen across all age groups, there are also specific causes that are more prevalent within each age range. For each age, there are actually slightly different things that occur in each age group. Uh, pretty much universally, illness and fever, trauma, um, and uh, intoxication or electrolyte disturbances can happen at any age group, but in the infant population, we're much more likely to see things like birth injury, uh, hypoxic ischemic damage, surprisingly stroke. Um, in childhood and teenagers, we're much more likely to see things like um, uh, underlying seizure disorders coming out uh, and then in the teenage population not just underlying seizure disorders starting to appear but also uh, intoxication and withdrawal from a variety of uh, toxicants. So there are several things uh, unique to the uh, neonatal and infant brain uh, that make it more susceptible to seizures in the first place. Children get uh, neonates get more sick they're susceptible to a lot more injury um, and more susceptible to uh, changes in their electrolytes than our older brains and uh, older children. Um, in addition, because of the immaturity of the, both the structure of their brain, the myelination, and uh, the chemistry of their brain, the different receptors that are expressed, they actually are much more susceptible to when they have a seizure to have a generalized seizure. So seizures in infants are very often caused by abnormalities in electrolytes. Um, in the setting of infants who are severely dehydrated, who haven't eaten for a while, they're much more at risk for being hypernatremic, having too much serum sodium. Uh, this disrupts the way that neurons fire and leads to seizure activity. Very similarly, and actually more commonly, infants that have been given water, they can't handle it very well, and they very rapidly drop their serum sodiums and become hyponatremic. Again, neurons don't fire very well in this setting and have a much higher likelihood of having seizures. Importantly, because this is always a possibility in the neonatal and pediatric population, uh, these abnormalities in electrolytes, it's very important to always use normal saline as your primary fluid when trying to resuscitate these kids in the field. So prematurity increases the likelihood of seizures in 
multiple ways. One, children who are premature don't have very uh, active kidneys, and so they're much more susceptible to electrolyte disturbances, which, as we just noted, can cause uh, significant seizure activity in children. Uh, in addition, kids who have a history of prematurity are much more medically complicated. They often have had things such as intracranial hemorrhages, which leave behind territories of the brain that are injured and make them more susceptible to seizures. They're more likely to have had hypoxic ischemic injury in their lifetime, also making them more susceptible to seizures. And then on top of that, children with prematurity who are medically complex are also much more likely to sustain trauma and non-accidental trauma in their lives just due to kind of stressors in the household associated with a medically complicated child and are often uh, the victims of abuse in that setting as well. To review, immaturity of the brain structure results in increased likelihood of seizures and that seizures will be more generalized in the infant population. Infants are very susceptible to electrolyte abnormalities and care needs to be taken to ensure that infants receive isotonic fluids and avoid excessive PO water intake. Additionally, prematurity will increase the likelihood and severity of these issues. And medically complex children may be at increased risk for abuse, which can result in an increased incidence of seizure from traumatic injuries. Understanding other pathologies with similar presentations, such as psychogenic non-epileptic attacks, sometimes referred to as pseudo-seizures, movement disorders, hypoxic ischemic injuries, and hypoxia-induced seizures resulting from syncope, will help providers to better recognize when a patient is truly having a seizure. First of all, we try to avoid the term pseudo-seizure. We prefer to use the term psychogenic non-epileptic attack, or just a psychogenic event, um, mostly because we want to start encouraging these people as soon as we see them that this is not a seizure, that their brain is not dysfunctioning, that this is a psychological event as opposed to a physiological one. Um, so PNEA or psychogenic non-epileptic attacks are things that look very commonly like seizures and may in fact look exactly like a seizure. Um, but are not caused by electrical activity in the brain but instead are caused by a psychiatric condition sometimes called conversion disorder. Um, some important indicators that your patient may not be seizing because not everything that jerks is a seizure. Um, if your patient is moving all four limbs in a rhythmic manner but is able to talk to you, that is extremely unlikely to be a seizure, maybe a movement disorder or maybe a psychogenic non-epileptic attack. The reasons for this are the territories of the brain that are involved in movement, especially movement of the two sides of the body, are pretty near the frontal part of the brain that is involved in consciousness and keeping you awake and able to talk. And so if a patient is able to, is having rhythmic jerking movements of all four limbs, but is still able to carry on a lucid conversation with you, the likelihood is it's not a seizure. Most types of seizures are associated with the eyes being forced open, even though the eyes may be rolled up or deviated in some way, but eyes closed is usually an indicator that this may not be an actual seizure activity, but something else going on. Uh, big abnormal body posture, so for instance, people who are bending backwards in a C has a big fancy name called a pistotonus, which is almost all, never used, but uh, very rarely occurs in the setting of actual electrically based seizures. Um, in addition, pelvic thrusting is something that pretty much never occurs in the setting of real seizures, essentially because the part of the brain that is that does that is actually spread over a lot of cortical territory and is usually not involved in a, a seizure movement. Uh, looking at the differential diagnosis of uh, rhythmic movements that may or may not be seizures. Um, movement disorders, so people who are in tic flurries uh, with Tourette syndrome may also appear to be having seizures, but again, these patients will be able to interact with you despite the fact that they're having rhythmic movements of all four limbs. People with uh, other types of movement disorders can also appear to be having seizures, and it's important to just ask if they have a known movement disorder. Um, in addition, people who have suffered hypoxic ischemic injury, so have been drowned or hanged, hung, uh, may also appear to be having rhythmic movements of their arms and legs that may or may not represent seizure activity. This is sometimes called hypoxic myoclonus. Um, and unless it is essentially continuous and kind of propagated, it doesn't necessarily need to be treated before you arrive in the hospital. In addition, people who have had uh, syncope or passing out episodes, especially if they're kept upright, may actually have what appear to be seizures and actually are. They're hypoxia-induced seizures um, that can occur as they're falling or as they hit the ground and before their brain is appropriately reperfused. 
This does not necessarily mean that those seizures need to be treated as seizures and that they need to be given medicine for them. The most uh, useful uh, tool for repairing that type of seizure is to reperfuse the patient and to get blood flowing as soon as possible again. After watching this episode, participants should now have a good understanding of the definition of terms such as seizure, epilepsy, and status epilepticus. Additionally, participants should understand the pathophysiology of seizures in children, including common causes of seizures in each age group, seizures in the infant brain, and risks for premature and medically complicated children. Lastly, participants should now have a good working knowledge to aid them in the differential diagnosis between seizures and other similarly appearing pathologies, such as psychogenic non-epileptic attacks, movement disorders, and other physical manifestations and behaviors.